Hello, good morning, good morning. I'm energized today because for those who are not aware, we had a wonderful two days retreat with our young and upcoming ministry leads. So it has been a wonderful, wonderful uh, time that we had with them. We went for a conference. We discussed about many issues of the church, and most importantly, we learned from what the God is, our God is teaching us from the Bible. And with that, I would like to just read this one particular verse in First Thessalonians chapter two, verse thirteen. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. And we also thank God const constantly for this. Then when you receive the word of God, and watch, that's what exactly we, we had uh, the past two days and obviously every day with the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of man, but as what it is really is. The word of God, which is at work, in you believers so if you are the believer of god today this word the same word that i read in the bible is the same word that will work in your life and i rejoice thank you we would like to invite pastor ping to lead us with the song today thank you A very good morning to one and all, and uh, so glad to see you this morning as we join our hearts and voices to worship the Lord. Uh, as uh, you, have, you can see on the screen in front of you, the theme for worship this morning is God's Word, my guide. And... Uh, Yesterday, in our opening session to our ministry leaders, uh, we, we talked about how God's Word is our all-sufficient guide. It is sufficient to complete us. It is sufficient to equip us for every good work. Are you convinced about that? Are you convinced that the Word of God is just that way? Well, if you are, then you can stand with me to sing our opening hymn, God's Sufficient Word. Let's stand together. The words are in the screen in front of you.
may be seated. For our scripture reading this morning, would you turn your Bibles to the book of 1 John. 1 John. And we are going to read the entirety of the fourth chapter. 1 John chapter 4. Twenty-one verses. We will read responsibly. I'll begin the first verse. You'll come in the second verse, and we shall uh, proceed in that fashion. First John chapter four, beginning in verse one. The apostle Paul John says, "Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world." By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his Spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. For we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is so, also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with judge punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he cannot see. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Let's go to our Lord in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful this morning that we have all gathered this morning in this meeting place that you have ordained to worship this God of love. Father, this morning we are thankful 
because you have manifested your love unto us by the sending of your Son into the world to go to the cross in order to shed his blood to redeem mankind from their sins. And through it, we might have life in your name. Father, as unbelievers, we have not known what true love is. But through your ultimate demonstration of love, we too have seen firsthand and experienced firsthand. We who are here, we who are here willingly, eagerly, worshipping you, have experienced what it means to love. And Father, you have called us then to love you and to love others. And that is the supreme example given by our Lord Jesus Christ when he was tested by the Pharisees who asked him what is the greatest commandment and it is that we love our God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength and our neighbours as ourselves. So Father, this morning, we confess that we do not do that perfectly. We confess that so often we fail. When there are opportunities to love, we have been, we have not taken a hold of those. And it does grieve us that we have not loved as we so desire to love we have not loved you as we so desire to do so our hearts can be cold towards our God our desire for you and for your word and to commune with you that desire waxes and wanes O oh Lord, we pray that you grant to us a heart that is wholly given in warm affection towards our God. We confess that we do not love our neighbours as we ought. We confess that so often we are preoccupied with our own affairs and we fail to see others who have needs. But Father, we do desire to grow in this area of love. And Father, in your word, you have told us that we cannot say we love God and hate our brothers. So help us to truly take this commandment to heart, that whoever loves God must also love his brother and sister. Father, we are thankful for this community. We are thankful for many brothers and sisters who have really made it a serious commitment to care for one another. And Father, as you have placed us in this body of Christ, it is our duty and responsibility to show care and concern for one another and to be able to reach out in what, which, whatever way we can. We all desire to meet needs of those who have needs in this season. And so, Father, I pray this morning that you would grant to us just a heart that is wholly given unto seeking you, loving you, and loving others. Father, this morning we continue to pray for the turmoil in the Middle East as we have given consideration to what your word has to say about this conflict, really one that has... Uh, gone on for a for thousands of years not just 75 years thousands of years and father we pray that ultimately what is going to bring peace is when these people in fact these who were chosen by you 
not because of how good they are or how mighty they are, but in your sovereign will, you have chosen these people in Israel to be your people. But they have rejected you and they need to turn to you. And we pray, Father, this morning that you would turn hearts to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ, to, 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 to realize that the servants described in Isaiah 53 is none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only one who can bring peace, even as the people would make peace with their God and embrace the God of peace so that they too might be able to exemplify peace in their lives towards you and towards one another. I pray that there are believers too in Gaza Strip and that hard as it may be at this time, that you would use these believers there to be salt and light to you. Father, we pray that humanitarian aids would be allowed in to relieve the civilians in Gaza Strip. We know that uh, a convoy has entered in and we pray that uh, more aid will be able to go in to this place. We pray for the Israeli political and military leadership that they would be able to have wisdom from you to know because there are all these hostages that are still kept under Hamas. We know negotiations are ongoing through third party states. We pray that these hostages, hostages will be released soon. We are thankful for two that has been released already. But we pray that Israel will really uh, be circumspect in terms of the military response uh, that they have been displaying and that you give wisdom to the leadership to know what kind of measured response they should uh, be giving. And Father, we pray for this conflict to come to an end. We pray for souls to be saved, to embrace Jesus Christ as the promised Messiah, prophesied of old in the Old Testament. And Father, this morning we pray for our own worship service, even as we look at the final section of the book of 2 Corinthians. We ask for your blessing upon uh, our time together and we pray that our own hearts will be strengthened, the need for building up relationships with one another will be strengthened and we ask all this in your son's most precious name, Amen. Thank you very much and let's go to our Next hymn, which uh, is found in the hymnal in front of you, in the back pocket of the chairs, turn to hymn 216, 216. God's Word is our guide, and it is wonderful, and we desire it for our daily food. So let's stand together and sing 216 Wonderful Words of Life, 216.
Thank you, and be seated. And now we will have uh, right, Eric to come and pray for the offering. Thank you very much. Truly, what a wonderful word. I want to welcome back the family, these sweet little girls, two little girls, welcome back. Very glad to see you this morning. Okay, I don't see any visitors this morning. Okay, uh, later, later. <laughs> um, okay. Um, any anyone new here this morning? No. Okay. Oh, okay. Because it's hidden by Brother Chang Po. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I I really can't see her. You know, because sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, Okay, okay. I was like, okay, okay. no, no, it, it's nothing to do with you, Brother Zhang Bo. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, well, well, welcome, welcome. Uh, good to see you again. Um, okay, uh, let, let, let's pray. Dear Lord, our Father in heaven, we want to give thanks to you for who you are, our God Almighty, the God who has given us and provided us all that we need and even in abundance. Father, we thank you for the love that you have for this church. And we know that God, that you have always been so, even before the foundation of this earth. Father, we thank you for the reading of the word this morning, that we know that you are God of love. And help us to be like you, to love those that are around us. Father, we thank you for those who also love the church in giving what they have for the kingdom of God. So Lord, we thank you once again for this beautiful time that we can give back to you the little that you have allowed us to give when you have given us so much. Father, we thank you for these souls. Thank you for these cheerful givers. We ask God that you will allow us to use this giving, this offering, this tithe for the furtherance of your kingdom to the end of this world. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
marvelous infinite grace of God, the redemptive and salvific blessing of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you very much, Grace, for helping us to meditate on this amazing grace of Lord Jesus Christ. And at this point in time, uh, Tina and Joshua will come uh, with a duet, Then Sings My Soul. to help us to meditate on the greatness of God and preparing our hearts in our worship to receive the word. Let's, before the children are dismissed, stand and turn in your hymnal. We should probably turn your hymnals first before you stand. 217, break thou the bread of life. 217. Two. 17, break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me. And at this point in time, we are coming to a point where we are having the word of God open unto us. 
It's our prayer for us to be prepared to receive that word with gladness. 217. Please be seated. Uh, as our brother Eric mentioned this morning, as we had our call to worship, I am very thankful for the two days we can spend together as ministry leaders. Uh, we had Friday and Saturday, these two days, uh, for our leadership retreat. And uh, I want to thank those especially who took leave to uh, actually attend the, um, the conference with Mark Dever. Uh, very, very helpful sessions that he gave uh, on preaching and on the church leadership, elders, and how to raise them up in the church. Uh, I know Leave is a very, very precious thing, right? You want, to take, you want to have that, go overseas, holiday, and so on, and to spend the time, you know, sitting in a conference, uh, I think really uh, touched my heart to show uh, the importance that you have placed upon this. But really then after that, we uh, had sessions of discussion together and what was precious really then is the ability for us to really spend a lot of time in fellowship and fruitful dis discussion together, uh, hearing from individual ministries and what needs they have, how we can pray specifically for these needs, uh, even individual needs as well. Uh, leaders are not just instruments, they are also human beings and we have needs as well, and we have challenges in our own lives. And I'm thankful that uh, we really had a wonderful, you know, time together, culminate in the dinner last night at Simpang Bado. So, yeah, very, very thankful 
uh, for how it went and and what was on the phone is when we can come together that really then what 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 then does happen is and I, I, I had this you know short chat with our, our deacons this morning the the inter ministerial collaboration starts to happen when a ministry leader of this particular ministry talk to the ministry of this leader of another ministry and all that, they say, how can we, you know, join forces? How can we work together? You know, we, we have a certain thing that we want to do. There's a certain evangelistic event that we want to you know, take place and all that. How can we work with this group and this group and all that? And we start to come together. That's a beautiful thing when I, when I see that. And it, it, it can only happen when we spend time together and extended time, really. Um, when we had opportunity to talk to one another and um, really to see how the Lord is guiding and leading. That is a wonderful thing. I mean, I, I was tremendously blessed uh, in these two days. So thankful for your joyous and willing participation, those who join. Uh, I mentioned last week about preacher sorrow. Uh, I will not bring that up, up again, but you'd be happy to know that today will be our final concluding message in the book of 2 Corinthians. All right, I'll be joyful. I'll be sorrowful to depart from this letter, but um, maybe you don't feel that way. Uh, if you think about it, probably the term that comes to mind that can describe Paul's relationship with this particular group of believers may be the word bittersweet. Bittersweet. I suppose we can use the term bittersweet to describe a lot of our close relationships. Would you use the term bittersweet to describe your relationship with your loved ones? As I previously mentioned, Paul wears his heart on his sleeve in this book we get a glimpse into the heart of an apostle. We see that an apostle of Christ is ultimately still a human being. Paul has his fair shares of sorrow, fears, afflictions, weaknesses, struggles like all of us do. And these he freely and openly shares with the believers in Corinth. But through these afflictions, Paul received comfort from God. He received letters, lessons in humility, and the grace of God that is so evidently at work in this apostle's life. Paul gives us, here's the term I will use all the time, a realistic, a realistic glimpse of what true biblical ministry is all about. What motivates someone to serve God? Very good. Here is a preacher in training. Preacher and right there. What motivates anyone to serve the Lord? I talk to the ministry leaders, really, you know, if there's one thing I would say to the ministry leaders, what is the most important thing? What is the most important thing you need to know about being a leader? All right? It is not about developing strategies. It's not about your mission statement, vision statement. It is not about uh, the specific equipping that you may need to fulfill your role competently and responsibly. Uh, really, none of those things really matters as much as that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And if a leader commits to loving God this way, I am not going to be concerned whether he will love his neighbor as himself because that will come. If a believer serves God because he loves God. He will serve God faithfully. He will serve God perseveringly. 
Why? Because difficulties will come. And these difficulties are designed by God to really test what motivates us. I think by this time you know that serving the Lord is not a glamorous thing. Believe it or not, some people want to go into ministry because it is a glamorous thing. They want to stand before people. But there are a lot of unglamorous things that has to be done in the ministry. And the test of whether we are serving God out of a pure motive would be when these unglamorous things occur. Are we willing to do those things? Or do we want to do only the things that seem glamorous? God tests that. And here, we have an apostle who was well tested in those areas. When people are going after your life, they want to kill you. Do you still want to serve the Lord? Do you still want to persevere in pursuing faithful, lifelong service to the end? So this is where we are. That's where the rubber meets the road. And for some who are unwilling or unable, then they will fall by the way. But for some, the testing becomes the testings become clarifying moments of what motivates them to serve the Lord. And in, in as much as these servants of the Lord continue to persevere in serving the Lord through the difficulties, through the challenges, that is where the Lord continues to mold them and shape them. And that is where the grace of God becomes very evident in their lives. And it is what we have learned here in the book of 2 Corinthians. If you look at the last paragraph in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning in verse 11, Paul says, Finally, brothers, rejoice, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. What we see here in this final paragraph of this letter really are the evidences. These are the proofs that these people are coming together. And these are joyful, joyous people doing life together. All right, the communal living here, we're not, we are not necessarily talking about, you know, you living in the same house, all of us living in the same kibbutz together, although, you know, that is, uh, you may have heard the term kibbutz used in Israel. These communities, they will come together, these different families coming together, and they will pool their resources. It is all in the same communal uh, pool, and um, that's not necessarily what we're talking about, but we are talking about purposing to come together to do life together, living together. We saw last week, verse 11, the four exhortations for us to be able to have joyful communal living. Well, this week we are going to see evidences when, when we aim for restoration, when we comfort one another, when we agree with one another, when we live in peace, these four, these four things, we are joyful. And then what other evidences do we see? Well, we see the next phrase that God is with us. You see the next phrase in verse 11? And the God of love and peace will be with you. Brothers and sisters, when you aim for restoration, when you comfort one another, when you agree with one another, when you live in peace, who is in our midst? What is that an evidence of? Who is present with us? 
Well, these are evidences that the God of love and peace is with us. You see, because love and peace find their source in God. In fact, these are attributes characterizing God Himself. And God's children ought to have these characteristics as well. Earlier on, in chapter 5, verse 20, Paul says that we are ambassadors for Christ. What is an ambassador? Well, he represents his own country in another nation. He doesn't have his own agenda and he puts out his own agenda. No, his agenda really is the agenda of the country that he's representing. We are kingdom citizens. We are the citizens of heaven. And we are representing heaven here on earth. We are representing this God of love and peace. Now, first of all, let's talk about this God of love. So we see here that God is described in two ways, that He is the God of love and He is the God of peace. Well, once again, where does our love come from? If you go back to 1 John chapter 4 that we read this morning, we read this passage this morning, in 1 John and the 4th chapter, you remember that we read these words, beginning in verse 7, John says, Beloved, let us love one another. Why? Because love is from God. Love finds its source in God. You jump down to verse 9. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son to the world, that we might live through Him. Once again, God demonstrates His love by sending His Son to the earth where He would ultimately shed His blood on the cross, give His life to redeem sinful Men and women, you and I, children, boys and girls, who have put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that is a wonderful thing that God has done. This is the sacrificial love that God has given to us. The, the best gift is the free gift of Christ. And it is because God has demonstrated that love and that we have received this gift in God that we too might be able to then demonstrate this love to one another. I always think that it is helpful to distinguish biblical love from romantic feelings or even lust. I always tell couples in my premarital counseling class that when the world uses the word L-O-V-E, all right, they use it in their music. You see that in the movies. Well, you shouldn't see it in the movies. Really, when they say, when they use the term love, and they say, I love you, and all that, there are two things that they're referring to. They are either referring to romantic feelings that they have for the other party, or they are referring to the lust, L U S T, that they have for one another. If you study biblical love, it always takes place in the context of conflict, disagreement, really when this thing is hard to do. You see, who does God show His love to? People who are very lovable, people who are very beautiful, people who are very obedient and submissive to this God? No. He showed His love to rebellious, disobedient sinners. <clears throat> that is the context of love. And if you think about the chapter of, of love in 1 Corinthians 13, who are these people? The Corinthian believers. Remember, these people were characterized by their contention and their division. And Paul was so fearful 
that these sins would continue to surface in this church. Back in chapter 12, verse 20, he, he says, you know, of, of St. Corinthians, he's afraid that these people would continue to be guilty of quarreling and jealousy and anger and hostility and slander and gossip and conceit and disorder. It is in this context that love is demonstrated. Paul tells these people who were guilty of these things to love one another. To be long, you think about it, long-suffering. That's the King James word, right? Charity suffereth long. Why would you need to be long-suffering to another person? The Chinese translation, heng jiu ren nai. What kind of people do you need to run? Do you need to put up with? Do you need to endure? These are people who would irritate you, annoy you, offend you, hurt you. Yeah. That is where real love is exercised. In other words, look, we are not going to be concerned about whether we will love nice people, people who are nice to us, we already do. That's not the issue. The test of love is in the midst of conflicts and difficult relationships. Okay. You know, just wrap your mind. Two same people say, I love you, I love you. And they are filled with a lot of romantic feelings for one another. And the guy, one fine day, asks the girl, would you marry me? And the girl says, of course I do. Nobody else. Can. And all of the wonderful romantic things that you know, she would say to him. And the big day comes. They get together. But 20 years later, or maybe even not even 20 years, I, I think statistics shows in the first five years, first five years, when that romantic feeling wanes, And there are now discussions of them going their separate ways. Same two people who said they love each other and their hearts were pumping really fast. Can, years later coming down, have some serious discussion whether they should part ways? Why? Didn't they say they love each other? And then at some point they say, you know what, I don't think I love you anymore. I fell in love with you and now I've fallen out of love with you. What they were actually saying is, you know what, I have a lot of romantic feelings for you. And that is fine. That is what brings people together. All right? It is, it is a feeling that God has created. But love, ultimately, is really not a feeling. If you look at, the, at 1 Corinthians 13, the first thing Paul says is, Love, charity, suffereth long, and is kind. Not very romantic when you have to put up with someone. And then it really actually then becomes not just a feeling, but really a choice you have to make to put up daily with that individual. And at some point, these two people are saying, You know what? We are choosing to not do that. And we are choosing to part ways. Same two people years ago who claim that they love each other. And actually, when all these conflicts shows up after they get married, that is really where they have to choose to say, I love you. And unfortunately, there are some couples who choose to part ways. Now, let me ask this question. There are other couples who choose to stay together. And folks, there are people who come and go in our church, and maybe certain things have happened, right? Someone has said some things to offend you, done something to hurt you, and so on. They say, well, you know, that's for this point, not a place for me. Well, there are couples who do that, and they say, well, maybe, maybe, maybe the two of us 
are not meant to be together. So we part ways. Let me ask you, the couples who choose to stay together, is it because they are married to, perfect, to a perfect spouse? Couples who are married and you are still married, answer me the question. Church members who choose to stay in this church. Is it because this church is a perfect church? Really, the actions of love is carried out in the context where you, you, are, you are dealing with, you are relating with imperfect people who sin, who fail, And if you really think about it, you yourself is that way. Actually, you know, you're, you're not a guiltless individual. You're also a guilty party. And love is exercised in the context where they are full of imperfect people. That is where love is exercised. You know, one way I often think about this, because you know, you know how conflict is, right? You know, this is the guilty person, I'm not. You know, look at how terrible this person is and I'm not. One way I've been thinking about this is, you know, I've been such a rebellious sinner, yet, sinner, yet God loved me enough to send His only begotten Son to die for me. How then can I hold a grudge against anyone? Surely I can forgive him, I can forgive her as Christ has forgiven me. Surely I can be merciful to him, to her, just as Christ has been merciful to me. You can think about it. God has all the power to destroy us. We can perish just like that. Yet, God spared me. Surely I can be gracious towards others. You know, there's no room for us to say with the Pharisee, where he prays to God, Lord, I'm so thankful I'm not like this publican next to me, this sinful tax collector, the traitor of Israel. Who am I to say that? I'm a beggar. Rather, we should say with the tax collector, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Be merciful to me. And because God is love, He has given us the supernatural ability to love what kind of people? Lovable people. Very, you know, they're so nice to us. No, no. Unlovable people. Because we ourselves were first unlovable people and God chose to show His love to us. Right? Next, we have the God of peace. If you go back to first, uh, Second Corinthians, here Paul says that when you do all these things, it is an evident that the God of peace is with you. Peace. I mean, the illustration is so readily available. Everybody wants peace, right? We, we talk about this all the time. The Middle East, everybody there wants peace. But there's never been peace, almost like ever. That is a pretty macro view, right? Let's just talk about our own selves. Our minds so often are full of turmoil, which is why there's such a big the, the topic of mindfulness is such a big deal today because if our minds are full of trouble, full of turmoil, full of worries. But I mentioned previously that people who walk with God and follow what He says in His Word are the most mindful people. All of the advice, He talk about meditation and all that. What was that? You know, presidential candidate. Meditate, you know, He taught LK White how to meditate and all that kind of thing. You know, that's so important, you know. Uh, you know what? Christians have been meditating 
for centuries. We meditate not on meditation or nothingness, which is what the meditation in this world is about. I mean, how do you possibly empty your mind? The mind abhors a vacuum. How can you just empty it and not think about anything? I'm thinking about nothing right now. The topic is nothing. Well, isn't that something that I'm thinking about? It's nothing? We meditate on the Word of God. And our minds can be at peace because we have the peace of God ministering to us. Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. You know this, you know this, when a terrible news strikes you like a ton of bricks, totally unexpected. The peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Think about your heart and your mind. There's something vulnerable, but what is guarding it? It is the peace of God. It is holding God over your heart and your mind. You mean... Christians ought to be the most mindful people, if that is the case. 1 Corinthians 5.23 Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. God's peace will sanctify you. And I love Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, He raised the Lord Jesus Christ. He rose from the dead. He is the great shepherd of the sheep. By the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do His will, working in us that which is pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I love this passage because the means by which God's peace is given to us is through that great shepherd of the sheep. You remember Psalm 23? The ministry of our great shepherd makes us lie down in green pastures and we can feed, we can drink by the river. He anoints our head with oil. He plays before us this great spread. I mean, our, our great shepherd ministers great peace to his people. You are his sheep. And through the ministry of Jesus Christ, our great shepherd, that is where we receive this peace. Once again, we can have peace with God through Christ. Because after, even after we are saved, we continue to receive this ministry of peace from our great shepherd to us. Brothers and sisters, what is causing your mind to be in turmoil this morning? What troubles you? What keeps you up at night? Or what disrupts your sleep? You know, you were sleeping well till three in the morning and now you're up. Your mind starts to spin. And these thoughts are coming to your mind. Meditate on these wonderful promises from God. He is the God of peace. And He has promised you that He will continue to minister this peace in the midst of turmoil and trouble. So here is the evidence that this God is with us. He is the God of love. He is the God of peace. But now... Verse 12, greet one another with a holy kiss. There you go. Here's a command from God. Who is our usher this morning? <laughs> Jeremy, do you have the conviction of greeting one another with a holy kiss that, that the way you greet our guests and our regular attenders this morning was with a holy kiss, brother? <laughs> Well, isn't this, a, this is in the Bible, right? It's what we should do. Um, we can talk about how in our culture, we don't really do this. Asian culture, 
not really, you know, you don't really greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, I think others of you who have been exposed to other cultures would may be familiar with this. When I was in the Middle East, that is how people greet one another with a holy kiss on the left cheek, on the right cheek. Man with man, women with women. Not a man with a woman. All right? Uh, so I can't say that I'm an expert in holy kisses. So let me quote a commentator who is probably able to give us uh, some help in this. Okay, before I show the next screen, I'll, 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 I'll just describe this to you. He says, A kiss appears in the New Testament as a sign of respect and greeting, of love and reverence, and of reconciliation and family fellowship. We find a parting kiss in X 20, 37. This is uh, Paul kissing the elders, the Ephesian elders. He says a, ho a holy kiss represents something more than a social custom. Here it is. He says it is a sign of mutual fellowship among people, persons of mixed social background, nationality, race, and gender who are joined together as a new family in Christ. The holy kiss becomes a token of the joy, love, reconciliation, peace, and communion that Christians know in Christ and with one another. End quote. David Garland in his commentary on 2 Corinthians, pages 554 to 555. What then does a holy kiss represent? It really then is an internal evidence of love towards one another. So a holy kiss need not necessarily be the way you show love to one another in this part of the world. Now, if you want to do it, fine. You can. Okay? I'm not going to prohib prohibit that. But there also are many ways that we can show affection to one another. In this case, specifically, when we see a brother or sister in Christ, Maybe what we can say is that maybe the most parallel to this would be a hug. But then again, you know, that is not, we don't regularly see this. Maybe you should do it more. A hug, some kind of, some kind of affectionate greeting. And, and, and the point really is, and I will put this quote up on the screen. You have it, you know, uh, PowerPoint and so on. The point is, I am glad to see you. I'm glad to see one another. And here is a sign of affection. I call it internal because it is done within the context of a local church. And can I also make this point? They cannot really give a holy kiss or any other signs of affection, physical affection, over Zoom or live streaming that the holy kiss, a holy hug, a holy sign of affection can only be done in person, not over Zoom. And unless this morning you're traveling, you're sick, and that is the only reason why you should be on Zoom, there is a need for us to not neglect the physical gathering of the local church because in part we are physical beings. We are physical beings. You are not a virtual being. As much as today we talk about the virtual and so on, ultimately, you are still you in your physical being. Is there any wonder why the mental health of individuals went down during COVID-19 where people had to socially distance themselves from one another. Especially concerning were the, really not just mental health, but the physical health of our elderly. Elderly folks, they really decline very quickly. I saw some of our elderly relatives when, you know, uh, when we were able to see them again, usually over Chinese New Year and so on, and I said, wow, they have really declined. 
why? And I talked to, you know, their caregiver, my cousins and so on. They said, yeah, you know, not able to get out and all that, just by themselves at home and all that. And I will just say that, you know, you may feel that, you know, you know, I'm just not by nature a people's person, right? I'm not the, the life of the party, you know. I do prefer to, you know, do things on my own, you know, just you know, be by myself and all that. And uh, I, I, I see people as a disturbance to my, to, my, to, to my life and all that, you know. When a WhatsApp message comes up, it's, it's really terrible, you know. Why must this person communicate with me? Why am I not living in a world where it's just I, me, and myself? Well, the fact is, God has not created you to be living in isolation. God has created you as relational beings. It doesn't matter whether you like things more than people. We all need fellowship. We all need community. Yes, yeah, some people, yeah, typically, we, we talked about this yesterday. We were very open about this. Men. Right? Men. I, I can, don't see anybody for the entire day and all that. I'm still fine, you know, you know. Uh, what, what's, what's wrong? Uh, nothing wrong. This is perfect, man. You know, not a single living soul. I just do my own work. Right? You know. No, 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 no. That is never the way. That is never God's design. We need one another. And we need to see one another. We need to feel one another. Right? There's that physical aspect. You know, that... Holy kiss. That is a physical thing. All right? But then he says, next thing, all the saints greet you. All the saints greet you. And by saying all the saints, he's referring to all the saints who is with him during the time of his writing. Which other words here is, external evidence of affection. And these are the saints, and where is Paul when he's writing 2 Corinthians? He is in Macedonia. And he is with the body of believers, the community of believers in Macedonia. You know, we often think that Paul, he is writing his letter in this room by himself. Maybe he has a, has a secretary who is kind of helping him with some secretarial work, and it's just him and himself. No, no, no. The fact that he is, at this time, in Macedonia, means that he's ministering to the believers there in Macedonia. He is with the saints there, and the saints there say, Oh, Paul, you're writing to the Corinthians. Send, send them our, our greetings. It is hard to fathom that Paul, who is encouraging the churches to live life together, right? I mean, uh, 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 he's telling them to do this, all these things together, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace with one another, would himself live in isolation in his, in his own ivory tower. No. He is ministering to the saints in Macedonia and they are sending their greetings to this church in Corinth. And really here then would be not just us in Grace Independent Baptist Church in 547 Upper Changi Road is just us and ourselves, but there is that need for us to have relationships with not just beyond these four walls. Have you ever had the blessed experience of traveling overseas and meeting overseas believers? Immediately, the, the camaraderie and all that is just... There is just that attachment and kinship that is established right away. And you may not even speak the same language. You don't have the same culture. But the fact that there is that immediate attachment is because we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, sometimes we have a tendency to become real myopic in our own local church ministries. Just as us, what are we doing in our own self, with our own selves? And I would encourage you, and Brother Joel is doing this, you know, is to take a mission trip beyond these borders to see what God is doing elsewhere. 
you know, our God is a big God. And He's unfailingly carrying out His plans to redeem sinful creatures for His glory. I cannot forget the experience that when I was in, in Israel in 2018, that we, one part of our trip is that we went to Bethlehem. You know Bethlehem? You know, something happened in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, right? You know. um, Bethlehem is not in Israel, Israel. Bethlehem is in the West Bank. We travel from Jerusalem, and okay, to, 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 to help you see how small the country is, from Jerusalem to Bethlehem was 20 minutes by our coach. You know, where will you take a bus, 20 minutes, and get you there? It is, it is, it is it's a very small place. But we do have to cross the border crossing, the wall, into Palestinian West Bank. And when we were there, and Mr. was with us, he, have, he actually has a relationship with a particular church, Baraka Bible Presbyterian Church. It was pastored by an elderly man, and at the time, he was transitioning his ministry to hand over to his son. Here was a Palestinian Christian. You know, this kind of blows your mind, because in, in, in your mind, the category of Palestinian are these people who are terrorists, right? Extremists, Islamic, Islamic terrorists, you know, they want to kidnap Israeli and all that, and they want to kill all the Jews. But here were Palestinian Christians and conservative Christians, Bible Presbyterians. They're not Baptists, but, you know, I guess as, uh, uh, if I were to fellowship with anyone, you know, Bible Presbyterian will, will, will do too. And it was so interesting to hear from their perspective about what is happening there. They were Christians. They are trying to interpret what is happening in their land through biblical lens too. But they will also acknowledge that some of the policies of Israel towards the Palestinians have not been right. The economy has been depressed for years, jobless rate is high, unemployment rate is high. A lot of people just want to leave, leave the Palestinian territories to go find work elsewhere, but better life elsewhere. And they gave us material. Here is this booklet. It is on Arabic. Oh, is this the Quran? Right? Arabic must be Quran, right? No. This is a tract in Arabic. They gave us a calendar. It's in, all in Arabic. Put up by a Christian organization. They talk about their evangelistic and mission endeavors going across to Jordan with all kinds of supplies, because back in 2018, you know, the, the, the Syrian crisis was still you know, uh, ongoing, and these are Syrian refugees, they were coming through, and here are these Palestinian Arab Christians, ready with blanket and food, and medicine, and the gospel. <coughs> they gave me this little device with a little solar panel, that contains all the MP3, uh, MP3 recordings of, 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 of the Gospel and, and, and the Gospel of John and so on and so forth, all kinds of messages on it. And you don't, it's not even battery run. You just put it under the sun, it, 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 it powers itself, and you can stick a headphone in and you can listen to the Gospel. And they say, we have given all of these away. I mean, our context is here, is, is here in Asia. I can tell you what's happening here in Asia, elsewhere and all that, but to hear what God is doing in the Middle East, that's amazing. That's amazing. It was very eye-opening for me. Sometimes, these work is difficult and slow. When I took Judson to Taiwan, we, I, I emailed the Bolans and said, you know, we'll be there in Kaohsiung and we'd love to see you. And they said immediately, Please come and stay with us. And that's what we did. And they gave, their, gave up their master bedroom for Judson and myself. And I met with the Bolans. I met with another American missionary, you know, who were pastoring the church there, handed over to him by another retired American missionary. And they talked about how, I mean, 
we, we don't think about this. Okay, but I, I think you can understand this. Okay, those of you who are Mandarin speaking and all that, fine, no problem. That's what you do. But can you imagine the rest of you have to speak Chinese from sun up to sundown? You know, you have to preach in Chinese, which is not, it's like me trying to do it in Chinese and you'll just laugh at me. Uh, and the rest will scratch their head and you all will just, right? And to talk to people in Chinese and all that. And, and, and how going back at the end of the day, after a full day of ministry, just how absolutely exhausted that is. And how this particular missionary, his wife had a life-threatening autoimmune disease that almost killed her 20 years ago. And that 10 years ago, his two-year-old son had an issue with the brain that requires emergency brain surgery. People will say, why are you still here? Why aren't you back home? Where you can get the kind of care that you, can need, that, that, that you need. Why are you still here in this place? Well, you know, the Lord compels His servants to serve Him in different places. And they are where God wants them to be and they are in a blessed place. I mean, some of us, our heart just goes out to them because we really don't understand why they are still doing this. You know, you have every reason. We totally understand why you want to quit the mission field. But why are you still here? And if they say, you know, look, my wife has a life-threatening disease. My son has had brain surgery. I want to go back home. And they, everybody will say, yes, yes, please. We totally understand that. But they are still on the field. Why? Why? Paul thanks the Philippians in Philippians 1, 3 to 5. He says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always remembering in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Here it is. What a wonderful privilege it is for us to partner with these missionaries. The Lord instructs us to pray in Luke 10 too, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. What a wonderful privilege it would be for us, for our Grace Independent Baptist Church, to be able to one day send out his very own laborers into the field. And then for these missionaries to write back to us and for them to say, all of these saints greet you. And then finally, we see here in verse 14, look at this, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Do you see anything that kind of jumps out? Yeah. The triune Godhead, all the three members of the Godhead is there. Here is the Trinity's involvement in joyful communal living. You see, We often think about the local church in very human terms, right? Brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, we need to do this, we need to do that. There is this event coming up, we need help here and all that. But you know, this community is a supernatural community that is built by all three members of the Godhead. Have you thinking of it in terms of that? When you experience grace, when you experience love, when you experience fellowship, it is because the Godhead is at work. And I do believe, believe there is significance to the order given by Paul here. First of all, he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Grace, for playing the hymn, the infinite, amazing grace of God. Here is a person with a name whose life manifests that. And specifically, 
this grace spoken of here, which appears in several, at the end of several books, you know, 1 Corinthians 16, 23, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Philippians 24, uh, 2, uh, 4, verse 23, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your, with your spirit. Philemon, verse 25, says the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. The grace spoken of here by Paul refers to all of the redemptive and salvific blessing. Salvific comes from the word salvation, saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. This grace refers to the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is what Paul talks about in uh, chapter 8, verse 9. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sake He became poor, so that you by His poverty might become rich. And once again, I think Brother you know, Wei Chi talks about this, it is not simply talking about financial riches. All right? The grace here refers to salvation. We are spiritually rich. So this is the gospel grace, the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of Godhead, who went to the cross to die for our sins. This is the first thing we experience when we are saved. We receive the grace of God in our lives. And then, secondly, we see the love of God. Once again, we have talked about that just now, the love of God. Here, the Apostle Paul reiterates that. 1 John 4, 9 and 10, In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And John would say that we are able to love because God is the one who first loved us. And so, therefore, the significance, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. So having received the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are now able to show the love of God to others. All right? We who have received the love of God, experience the love of God, ought to then show that to others. It is a supernatural love that we have received. It is a supernatural love that we show. Once again, to what kind of people? Lovable, nice people? No. People who irritate us, you know, that really, you think about it this morning, you know, it's like, you know um, no way. Well, that's how the world is, right? But we are even supposed to love our enemies. And then, here it is, the third thing. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit. What does this mean? This has reference to our fellowship with one another brought about by the Holy Spirit. So, having experienced the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the supernatural love shown by the Father, we can have genuine and deep fellowship with one another. You think about this. There is absolutely nothing humanly in common that we have with one another, right? Nothing. Some of you are from other countries, working here, living here, set settled here. You all do different jobs, right? Different, all kinds of different background. There's nothing we have in common except one thing. The Holy Spirit is in us. The Holy Spirit. Really, the sense, if you are able to come together in community, it is an evidence that the Holy Spirit is at work in your life. This is a true gift and something that we should receive with much gratitude rather than take for granted. I think, you know, sometimes at least what lesson I've learned from COVID-19 was to never ever take the gathering of God's people for granted ever again. But you know how the devil takes that, right? Some people say, hey, this is not bad, what? Zoom? I mean, I can be drinking my coffee, eating my tau sapia, which I, I guess we had this morning, right? tau sapia. You know, in my pajamas. And this is not bad, man. Come on. We get dressed up. You know, make sure I have decently smelling and come here and... Man, that's so inconvenient.
Well, the devil may spin that and it may sound so attractive, right? Who want to just roll out of bed and all that and I can be lying on my sofa, looking at a television screen and all that. This is life, man. Praise God. Let's worship Him. No. The Holy Spirit saved us for fellowship. And in spite of how different we are from one another, there's no reason for us to come together. But yet we come together because we have the Holy Spirit living in us. And we think about it, that's what the church is all about. The church is made up of people who have been, this is a rebellious, sinful, unlovable people, saved by the grace of God, who have experienced the supernatural love of God in spite of every reason God has for casting us into hell. And now we are able to have fellowship with fellow believers because the Holy Spirit has, has done that work in us. Yes, if you dare to get close to another brother or sister in Christ, what will you see? You say, yeah, I see their warts and all. Yes, you will. Because once again, this is another human being. But you will also see their strengths and you will also see evidences of God's grace at work in their life. You will see this brother's struggle, this sister's failure, and you will see victories and successes by the grace of God. Yes, living life together, frankly speaking, to be honest, yes, it's a messy affair. But it is a beautiful mess worth getting into because through it all, God is using these things to shape us, to mold us more and more into the image of His Son as well. Yeah, sometimes we do not know what we can expect. But one thing is for sure that by living lives together, we are all growing together in Christ. Here are the questions that you can think about. How is your life for others in the church tested? And what biblical attitudes should you adopt in such situations? What is the significance that all three members of the Godhead are involved in building the church? How does that shape your understanding of the church? And here's just something you, know, you can think about. What aspect of the Second Corinthians really stood up to you in our study together? This one and a half years. Let's pray. Father, we stand amazed at what you are doing to build your church. Forgive us for seldom thinking about your church in these terms. Forgive us so often when we focus on the natural aspects rather than the supernatural aspect. Father, we are thankful that through the grace, the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, through your amazing demonstration of love to us, by which we can enjoy fellowship with one another through the Holy Spirit. that what we are beholding is something amazing, supernatural. Never should happen apart from the saving gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ that has brought us together. Father, we are thankful when brothers and sisters do show love to one another in spite of the failures and the weaknesses that we see in one another. That that is you at work. Help us 
to be thankful. Help us to see it in these terms. Help us to realize that living life together is a messy affair. We are all like porcupines. We will put one another from time to time. And we put others as well. Let us not forget that. So <laughs> help us to realize that. And so we pray that in spite of these, you are doing a work in our hearts. Help us to submit to your purifying work in our, our life. We have prayed that we will be sanctified, that we will grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the context you have placed us in is where you have placed us in for that growth. So Father, help us to rejoice in all that you are doing. You are doing amazing work in our hearts. And we pray that we can see that. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is 483. Uh, here is a prayer for us to love the Lord more. Let us love the Lord who bought us, pitied us when enemies called us by His grace and taught us, and so on. Um, you say, I don't know this hymn. Well, you may not know the words very, very well, but I think you will know the tune. And it prepares us for Christmas, actually. Let's stand together. 483.
man, will you see it? Now we have the announcement from Brother Eric.